This would be, uh, what would it say? Monday, November 24th. We'll take a look at our story about the lottery and the bell work. We'll go on from there. Uh, book report comes due in 24 days. I have a test coming up in a week. Information's behind me. There we go. Uh, let's see. The bell work. You had to tell me about traditions. For many of you, we have a tradition coming up this week. What is the tradition that we do this week? Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving. The idea of traditions is, one, how long has your family been doing the tradition of getting together and eating food? Every year. Since before you were born? Since before your parents were born? No. No. That idea of traditions is the fact that they've been around a long time. Some traditions, we know how they get started. Do you guys know why we do Thanksgiving? Yes. Because it goes back to pilgrims. So the idea that some traditions we know is good, but we don't necessarily know the idea behind all traditions. We just handily accept them. The idea of bringing a Christmas tree into our house and decorating it with baubles, baubles being shiny little objects. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't know. My parents did it and because we do it because we're American. Um, and so it's just this thing that you do. Obviously it was because Jesus was born under a tree. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. And so that's where the issue comes in. We do it just because we just accept it. It's just an accepted part of things we do. For 4th of July, what is the tradition we have? Ooh, uh, uh, fireworks. You know why we do fireworks on the 4th of July instead of like high fives? Cannons. It's supposed to represent war. The idea that you have fighting going on. We're representing our fight for liberty. But then we have Easter with bunnies and eggs. And we have the connections there. And most of us don't have as much of an idea as to why we do that, because once again, Jesus was not born from an egg, uh, nor did he come from a rabbit. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You're right. But I'm sure that you have ideas behind it. We're not going into it right now, because I could really care less. It's okay. It's the idea that we have these traditions where even if you know, it's the fact that most people don't know. And even the one you might know, someone else is going to argue like, no, that's not why we do it. And the fact that you argue. The idea that traditions exist, all I'm going for. And the fact that you don't know why they exist is fine. You just do them because you've been told to do them. The other thing to hit is lotteries. Do you know what a lottery is? Yes. Yes. Does a lottery have to deal with money? Yes. yes. Uh, the reason being, we do a lottery in this class. A lottery that you guys kept asking me about. What lottery do we do in this class? Tie game. Tie game. It's where you have random chance to win. And so we do a lottery in here every week. We have a random chance of winning. Some of you get pulled. Some of you do not. The same idea being with um, the Hunger Games. Those of you who went to go see uh, the Mockingjay. Still not caring. You have the idea of the lottery, which is the reaping, where they pull out the boy and the girl to go and do the, the stabbing and the killing. You're not winning money in that one. You're winning the chance to go kill small children. And that's even better than money. Good job. I know. And so that would be another example of a type of lottery. It just means we have a chance of getting pulled to do some kind of winning. Keep both of those in mind as we get into our story. With this one, I'm going to read for most of today because I want to get through the boring beginning stuff. And what's the boring beginning stuff called? Exposition. Yeah, I want to get through all the exposition so we can get to the fun stuff. Because the fun stuff is really fun. But the boring stuff we need because when we get to the end of the story, there's going to be moments like, Mr. Brody, why? Why would you? And I'll say, well, remember that boring beginning stuff? And there's stuff happening that's going to explain why the ending happens. But we have to get to that part to get there. So I'll read the beginning part, and then we'll get to that part. Um, pay attention to when our story is taking place and where our story is taking place. The lottery. The morning of June 27th was clear and sunny, with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely, and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square between the post office and the bank around 10 o'clock. Excuse me. In some towns, there were so many people, the lottery took two days and had to be started on June 26th. But in this village, where there were only about 300 people, the whole lottery took less than two hours. So it could begin at 10 o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. So when is our story taking place? June 27th. June 27th, which is the summertime. And then where is it taking place? The town. The village. In a village. How big is our village? 
300 yeah, to give you an idea of how big 300 people is, in 7th grade, we have about 550 kids in the 7th grade. In your lunch, you have about 350 kids just in your lunch. So there's more kids in your lunch than they have in their entire village. Is this the only town that does the lottery? No, no. No, they said other towns do it too. Um, the next part coming up, they're going to talk about as they're getting ready. There's a bunch of little boys, little girls running around doing stuff. Pay attention to what they do so that we can make fun of them. The ch children assembled first, of course. School was recently over for the summer, and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play. Their talk was still the classroom and the teacher of books and reprimands. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets full of stones, and the other boys soon followed his example, selecting the smoothest and roundest stones. Bobby and Harry Jones and Dickie Delacroix, the villagers pronounced his name Delacroix, eventually made a great pile of stones in one corner of the square, guarded it against the rays of the other boys. The girls stood aside, talking amongst themselves, looking over their shoulders at the boys and very small children. I'm sorry. And the very small children rolled in the dust or clung to the hands of their older brothers or sisters. So what is it the boys are doing? <laughs> Playing with rocks. What is it the girls are doing? Talking. Talking and Staring. Yeah, checking out the boys. Playing with rocks. So I'm not sure which is worse. Being the guys are like, oh, rocks. Or being the girls going, oh, check out the boys. Playing with rocks. Uh, so they're special. It's a small town. Rocks are exciting. Um, and then what is it the small kids do? Yeah, they just play in the dirt. Because apparently that dirt's like rocks, but less dangerous. Um, soon, the men began to gather, surveying their own children, speaking of planting and rain, tractors, taxes. They stood together, away from the pile of stones in the corner, and their jokes were quiet, and they smiled rather than laughed. The women, wearing faded house dresses and sweaters, came shortly after their menfolk. They greeted one another and exchanged bits of gossip as they went to join their husbands. Soon, the women, standing by their husbands, began to call to their children, and the children came reluctantly, having to be called four or five times. Bobby Martin ducked under his mother's grasping hand and ran, laughing, back to the pile of stones. His father spoke up sharply, and Bobby came quickly and took his place between his father and his oldest brother. The lottery was conducted, as were the square dances, the teen club, and the Halloween program by Mr. Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round-faced, jovial man, and he ran the coal business, and people were sorry for him because he had no children, and his wife was a scold. When he arrived in the square, carrying the black wooden box, there was a murmur of conversation among the villagers, and he waved and called, Little late today, folks! The postmaster, Mr. Graves, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was put in the center of the square. Mr. Summers set the black box down on it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between themselves and the stool. When Mr. Summers said, Some of you fellows want to give me a hand? There was a hesitation before two men, Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, came forward to hold the box steady on the stool while Mr. Summers stirred up the papers inside of it. Real quick, we have... A stool. Ooh. And what's on the stool? A black box. A black box. Mystery box. And what's inside the box? Papers. Papers. Ooh. Okay, that's about it. And so it's just a box full of papers. Not that exciting. I was trying to build it up, but that, that's all I got. The original paraphernalia. Yeah. What's a scold? Oh, a scold? It, you guys what it means to scold someone? Yeah. To yell at them a lot. Yeah, to yell at them a lot. So whenever you make poor choices in class, I'm like, bad kid, bad, now I have to beat you. That's scolding you. So if they're saying his wife is a scold, that means that's just all she does. She just like gives him a hard time and makes fun of him and stuff like that. Not the friendliest of people. Um, is he friendly? Yes. Yeah. And so he's sort of like that nice guy. He marries sort of a hag as my like third the, grade daughter. Like the, yeah. the necklace? Not the best. Yeah, something like very similar to the necklace. Yeah. Jovial means friendly and outgoing, happy, like me. <laughs> the original paraphernalia, that's a fancy word that means stuff, for the lottery had been lost long ago, and the black box, now resting on the stool, had been put into use even before old man Warner, the oldest man in town, was born. Mr. Summers spoke frequently to the villagers about making a new box, 
but no one liked to upset even as much tradition as was represented by the black box. There is a story that the present box had been made with some pieces of the box that had preceded it, the one that had been constructed when the first people settled down to make a village here. And every year, after the lottery, Mr. Summers began talking again about a new box, but every year the subject was allowed to fade off without anything being done. The black box grew shabbier each year. By now, it was no longer completely black, but splintered badly along one side to show the original wood color, and in some places, faded or stained. Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, held the black box securely on the stool. Oh, we're going to find out in a moment that what's in the black box now? Paper. paper. It didn't always used to be paper. We're going to get sort of like the backstory of what they used before paper. Mr. Martin and his Still oldest count. son, Baxter, held the black box securely on the stool until Mr. Summers had stirred the paper thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had been forgotten or discarded, Mr. Summers had been successful in having slips of paper substituted for the chips of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr. Summers had argued, had been all very well when the village was tiny. But now that the population was more than 300 and likely to keep on growing, it was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. The night before the lottery, Mr. Summers and Mr. Graves made up the slips of paper and put them in the box, and it was then taken to the safe of Mr. Summers' coal company and locked up until Mr. Summers was ready to take it to the square the next morning. The rest of the year, the box was put away, sometimes one place, sometimes another. It even spent one year in Mr. Graves' barn and another year underfoot in the post office, and sometimes it was set on a shelf in the Martin Grocery and just left there. So what they used before paper? Wood. Chunks of wood. And they're like, come on, that's ridiculous. We're 300 people now. We're humongous. So let's move up to paper. And they're like, ooh, paper. So they've upgraded to paper from they wood chunks. Wood? Technically, it's a form yeah. of wood, yeah. Don't be sassy. Zach. Is that it's saying, the other one is like, yes, there's typos. It's okay. Yeah. It happens. There was a great deal of fussing to be done before Mr. Summers declared the lottery open. There were the lists to make up, heads of families, heads of households in each family, members of each household in each family. There was the proper swearing in of Mr. Summers by the postmaster as the official of the lottery. At one time, some people remembered there had been a speech of some sort performed by the official of the lottery, a boring, tuneless chant that had been rattled off duly each year. Some people believe that the official of the lottery used to stand just so and he said or even sang it. Others believe that he was supposed to walk among the people. But years and years ago, this part of the ritual had been allowed to lapse. There had been also a ritual salute, which the official of the lottery had, had to use in addressing each person who came up to draw from the box. But this also had changed with time, until now it was felt necessary only for the official to speak to each person approaching. Mr. Summers was very good at all this, in his clean white shirt and blue jeans with one hand resting carelessly on the black box. He seemed very proper and important as he talked interminably to Mr. Graves and the Martins. Just as Mr. Summers finally left off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs. Hutchinson came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders and slid into place in the back of the crowd. Clean forgot what day it was, she said to Mrs. Delacroix, and there we'll stop. Almost got to the good part. Tomorrow we'll get to the good part. Um, your only homework is work on your book report. I'm at. We're good.